Okay, then. Here's the table of contents. Part 1, Biblical Christianity. Chapter 2, Roman Catholicism. Okay, so right away it's like saying, well, you got the biblical position, and then you've got those guys. So is that is he trying to win just by labeling uh, us as biblical and them as something else? Uh, he's not when you read it. He actually when I first saw that I was like eh, I just hate that. I hate trying to win by calling people names. Um, I don't like that. You guys who have been here for a while know you know some of the ways that plays out in um, the church. I don't like that. Win by argument and win by um, you know reasoning with each other. But that's what he does in the chapters, and he's clear that he, we're not saying. Can, Catholics and the Orthodox Christians aren't Christian. We're saying it's, they're, they're different. They're different enough that you need to um, just be aware of what they teach and how it differs from the way we talk and what we mean by these words versus what they mean by those words. Um, a, if you care about this one in particular, which is probably more likely, who, who in here has a Catholic background? Raised Catholic. I know you two. Okay. Uh, I wasn't raised Catholic, but my wife was. My mom was raised Catholic, so vicariously I've had Catholicism around me my whole life. And um, Jenny's family, my wife, um, is still Catholic, and the people she grew up with are like militant Catholics, like very Catholic. So when we get together for reunions and whatnot up in Michigan, um, we're we're in the deep end of the pool in the, way, the way they talk to us. They're trying to convert us, you know, because mm -hmm. you know, people going to hell. Don't bother with them, but these Protestants, you got to make sure that they're converted. Um, this is kind of how it goes. If you care about this topic, you can't get a better book than this. This one's called Roman Catholics and Evangelicals, it's subtitled Agreements and Disagreements, or Differences, sorry. Um, it's by Norman Geisler and the other guy named Ralph McKinsey. Both of these guys grew up Catholic. Dr. Geisler was a Catholic until he was 17. Um, and yeah, she went to uh, Jesuit school, so two of his degrees are from Catholic schools. Um, he knows what he's talking about. This book was is actually endorsed by some Catholics. He has an even number of Catholic and Evangelicals endorsing the book. Mm -hmm. So that's crazy. It's a book that's critical of Catholicism. Um, the reason is, they went to these guys, and at every step of the way, they sat down and they said, here's what we understand you to mean in Catholic. Catholic theology. Do we have it right? Just start there. Yep. You're exactly right. That is exactly what we believe. Okay, so the next step, do you believe this? Do you believe that? They did that so much with these, these, these uh, Catholic um, guys in the back here as consultants that they endorsed the book. They said, you know, whatever you think about it, these guys get it. They're representing us accurately. Who, and who are the Catholic? It is... Richard John Newhouse, I think he usually goes by John Newhouse, um, James Hitchcock, James Aiken, that's it, for the endorsements. I mean, if, someone, if you're writing against somebody and they endorse you, <laughs> you did a good job. You know, they didn't convince these guys or anything, but um, it, it's really a fascinating book. Uh, because it starts off, the first part is just, you know what we agree about, and we're we're gonna go through it tonight. There's so many there are so many things that we agree with Catholics about that they're part of the Christian family. And so, if anyone in here thinks that the Catholic Church is the Antichrist or is the prostitute in the Book of Revelation, I don't believe that. And um, hi. Uh, so, if you do think that, I hope that will at least dispel that. Um, but the uh, but there are serious problems. So why why is it we're able to say yes they're Christian, um, but these other things that are cults like those witnesses who use the Bible that's a bad translation of the Bible but they use the Bible Mormons use the Bible. Um, why do we call them cult and not uh, Catholicism? These the, these things we have uh, David Koresh um, name all the cults. There's usually a name that's the top you know the charismatic figure that rules. Right, the, everything they say goes, you just have to believe what they say. Sounds an awful lot like the Pope. And so a lot of evangelicals have said, well, look, here's what is a cult, and here's the Catholic Church. So um, there are arguments to be made. I don't think they hold. Catholics are Christians, and you'll be happy, I think, to go through um, you know, why we agree with them. Part two is why we disagree with them. So the Apocrypha, 
uh, you know, Mary, uh, infallibility of the Pope, their view of justification, the sacraments, all the things that we were like, mm, no, no, you know, you get that. That is, you're so wrong about those things that we can't even fellowship together at a church. Like, this, you know what ecumenicalism is? Um, it, it means uh, oneness, uh, where we work together with people that otherwise we disagree with. It's the, it, which is attractive, right? You, well, yeah, we want the body of Christ. We all want to work together. Um, but there are lines that you're not willing to cross, and if you're not willing to cross it, and they're not willing to cross it, there's not much you can do in terms of, like, worshiping on Sunday and being in Bible study in their church, you know, that type of stuff. Um, but social, uh, uh, fighting social ills, uh, we're, like, hand-in-hand hand with these guys. They, in many ways, have put the evangelicals to shame uh, as far as fighting uh, political and social battles. So um, we can, that, that, yes, worshiping together in ecumenical ways, no, um, because there are enough differences. And then, um, and then the part three says ways that we can practically, areas of practical cooperation. So, highly, highly recommend it. I'm going to be reading out of it a little bit tonight because there's, try and pack 2,000 years of similarities and differences into a <laughs> talk. And every time I was like, oh yeah, let me include, include that. And then a whole new line of, you know, information and reasoning was introduced that, no, I can't. So I'm going to be superficial only because to go into depth, we could talk about any one of these points for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, thousands of years actually, because that's what they have, how long they have been talked about. Um, so this will help you go deeper, and I'm going to read out of it tonight um, because I just didn't have time to, it, just on the way over here, I was listening to the, his talk, oh, i got to include that, but I can't, so I found the page, and I'm going to just read it. So, um, Okay. And then orthodoxy, does anybody have an orthodox Christian background? That's really rare uh, in the evangelical circles. Okay. Um, I don't either, but like I said, my wife and I have done a lot of mission work in Russia, so we've had to learn a lot about the Russian Orthodox Church. And um, so just I'll share just brief things on that. And um, Barry Leventhal, the guy we're going to hear from next week, he teaches uh, ecclesiology, which is um, the study of the church. And what he does for us is we have to go to the Orthodox Church locally here. It's called St. Nectaris. Um, beautiful church. Like, if you ever just want to go into a church, that really awesome. Um, just go in there and look at their icons and, and their um, decor. Uh, but we go in there and we hear a lecture from the Orthodox priest. And then we have Q&A. And then we have to write a paper about it. So uh, I learned a lot at that time. And then Dr. Leventhal will correct some of the things that were said. Like, well, actually, here's what he didn't quite represent that accurately. He pulls out, you know, their book and says, here's what they teach. And so it was very thorough, but that was years ago, so I uh, only remember the highlights. And I'll share those with you later. So, okay. You ready to dig in? Mm. All right, this is fun. So you'll probably remember this as former Catholics. Uh, you two you, and, and you, right? You said, okay. Um, Mark, right? Yes. Okay. You know, I was named Mark for about five minutes. And Mark, from the time that I was born, I was Mark, and they were ready to write it down, and they changed it to Eric. So, <laughs> I'm not sure why either. <laughs> My mom says she regrets it, so I'm like, but just to think of yourself as a different name is weird. So, anyway, I'll, I'll be able to remember that. Jen's husband, I can't remember his name. Right? <laughs> her name is Jennifer. My wife's name is Jennifer. Her husband's name is Eric. So we have Eric and Jennifer, Eric and Jennifer, mm. so it's like players and easy to remember. Yeah, yeah. I use that so much when we're playing cards and we have to have a team name, so it's generic. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I see. Okay, where do we agree? This is the fun part. Feel good, right? We all uh, want to just get along. Uh, there actually, I mean, are significant areas that we are not trivial. Sorry it's so small font. Um, I guess I could have done two slides. <coughs> This is interesting. The Bible, the thing we argue about the most, you know, interpretation, are we free to interpret the Bible? Actually, they agree with us. The Bible is the only written, inspired Word of God. It's not the Bible plus the Book of Mormon, the Bible plus the Quran. They agree with us. So we can hold hands on that one. They also, I, these are things that I guess I knew, but was, I didn't really think about how cool that it is until I started going through this. 
They do not think that any new revelation can be introduced. The job of the church, even the Pope, is not to give new revelation, but to interpret the revelation that we do have. Now, if you look through the history, you're like, well, you went this way here and then this way there on the same passage, um, so it's like a new revelation. But they do not think that anything can be revealed. God will not reveal anything new. It's closed. So that's cool. We're not going to fall into things like the Mormons and others. The Trinity, um, honestly, as Baptists, we would do well to have a catechism like Catholics do to teach our kids, you know, what is the Trinity? So when they're out there and they start sniffing around a cult, it's going to stink because they know what the, really, what the Trinity really is. This is usually the, the place, the Trinity, or who is Jesus? Is he God and man? Is he just man? Is he just God? That's where cults start. They start getting wrong, and then it just gets bad from there. So you got to know the Trinity as a Christian, what it means, what it doesn't mean. Um, if you want to sort of inoculate yourself and inoculate our kids against um, false teaching. Uh, Christ, they have the right view, just like with the Trinity. They, Christ is both God and man. He has two natures, but he's only one person. He's not um, schizophrenic. He doesn't have a divine consciousness. There's one consciousness, but with two natures. What that means, I don't know. I don't know how to say it, but we can't understand it. With the Trinity, right? Uh, the virgin birth, it's very important that he was born miraculously. Um, because if he was born just like all of us with a biological father, that he would be um, just like us. He couldn't have been divine. That's a whole other can of worms. How is original sin passed down? Uh, one of the theories is that it's through us as men, sorry guys, that we're the ones that pass on sin because that's why Jesus had to only have a brother. I don't think that's true, but that is a serious belief within uh, Christendom. Um, but she had it had to be a miraculous birth or conception. The atonement. Now this is like I did. The, okay, the, we'll go into it more later. But they actually believe that Jesus alone paid the full price for our salvation from the guilt and eternal consequences of our sins. Now, how that works out, grace and works, and all that, we'll, we'll talk about. But they get that exactly right. So that's good. Uh, the resurrection, Jesus rose uh, bodily, the same body. That's important because that's something that not even every evangelical gets right. That it wasn't some spirit body, it wasn't, he wasn't a ghost, it was his body. And it's the same body that went up to heaven, and it's the same body that's going to come back down uh, for the second coming and live in eternity with us, with our physical bodies. That's what the Bible teaches, that's what it means to be a Christian. Whatever you believe in, in the rapture and, and all that stuff, all of those beliefs, all those end times um, beliefs, all end with us having a body in an earthly kingdom forever, just like Jesus. So it's pretty cool. Ascension, that's what I just said, that he ascended physically. The church, there is a spiritual body of Christ to which all the saved belong. How they define a few of those things differs from us, but they do believe it. The second coming of Jesus, they believe it. Um, there's, just, there's probably more disagreement amongst us as evangelicals about the second coming. And we, as Baptists, we probably believe with, along with the Catholics uh, most of that. Um, heaven and hell, that's important. Especially, you guys been paying attention to the Pope? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why it was such a big deal. Because everyone's like, what did you say? Because, uh, no, that's not what we think. For 2,000 years, we've been very clear on that point. There is a heaven, there is a hell, it's immediate, it's conscious, and you will survive forever in one of those two places. Mm -hmm. Every human being has those two, those two as an option. So, uh, does anybody not know what we're talking about with the Pope? Is he speaking? I, don't, I haven't heard uh, of him. Next cathedra? Yeah. He that's, was not, and that's, okay, that's they're out. Well, he wasn't speaking oh, okay. next cathedra. This guy gets an awful lot of things wrong um, <laughs> to have any meaning to... The, you're giving the Pope this much reverence. Like, and he gets that wrong, that wrong, that wrong. It's like every time he talks almost, the Vatican has to put out a press release. Well, that's not really what he meant. What he meant was, or he wasn't speaking, you know, for the church. He was speaking, man, it's like, the more you have to, like, qualify what your boss is saying, <laughs> the more careful you should be about hiring him next time. Um, <laughs> of course, they can't. 
the smoke came out of the chimney, right? He, he's, the, he's the Pope. They're stuck. Uh, and yet, uh, anyway, we'll get into that a little bit later about infallibility. But, yeah, he, he, what he said disagrees with this. They're saying, uh, well, he, no, that's not what the church believes. But that, what he said and what he was quoted as saying by this, this uh, journalist absolutely contradicts uh, a real heaven and a real hell that's actual and eternal. And I, I read something on that about that journalist who he was an older guy and happened to be a, an acquaintance or a friend. Yeah. And a lot of people say he misquoted. He was an atheist and he misquoted the Pope on that. But I. The official you know. Vatican release was funny, I thought, because it was. Um, they didn't say he misquoted him on okay. their release. Maybe they've done more since then, but the original one was something to the effect of um, uh, the, what was reported in the paper. Uh, was a retelling of a conversation that was not meant to be an interview. <laughs> okay, but do you believe that? Can you clarify what he, what the Pope believes? That's all they could say is, well, he, he didn't think that was an interview. <laughs> mm. He didn't know the mic was on. You know, kind of yeah. Thing like that. Um, yeah, this, uh, this guy, I don't know. The Catholics that I know that get it, they're squirming right now. Uh, because he has said Catholics are real good defenders of natural law, which is what our political system is based on. So you have conservative, you know, culture warriors who are Catholic. Uh, Robbie George, uh, the gay marriage debate, the um, transgender debate, all that. Catholics are really good on that. And these guys are out there fighting all these battles. And then the Pope will say things that undermines what they're, what they're trying to do. And it's like, so I, I've asked a few of them, like, so what do you think? Well, you know, he, he can only speak infallibly about you know, matters of the ch of church and this and this and this. And so they kind of back up a little bit to, yeah, he's the ultimate authority to, but only on certain things. Uh, it's an uncomfortable position for people, for thinking Catholics, to be in right now. Um, the early confessions and the creeds, uh, we recite the Apostles' Creed as Protestants. Uh, that came prior to the Reformation, so you know, there are a lot of things that we would agree on. There's some creeds that we wouldn't, usually the later ones. But for the first three to six hundred years, everyone got out. There, there, it was easy to be one church because it was, um, it was pretty straightforward. These things that really uh, creep us out as, as Protestants, as evangelicals, started to be introduced later on. And especially, obviously, around the time of the Reformation, where it was just, it was insane you know, in terms of the indulgences being sold and so on and so forth. So any questions about this? Are you surprised by any of these that we agree with each other? I was. I think there's some caveats to some of those. There are. Um, well, especially the atonement. the atonement, right? It's like, okay, well, let's start saying what we mean by that, and uh, yeah, we don't believe the same thing at all. Um, heaven and hell, they believe in purgatory. Yeah. But purgatory is temporal. So the key word there is an eternal consciousness. So um, they believe that eternity will be spent in one of these two places. But you might have to work out a few things still. So purgatory is there for, for most of us to burn just a little bit to kind of... Sometimes a lot. Yeah, sometimes a lot. <laughs> Some a little longer than others. So, um, but that's not yeah. in the Bible, is no. it? No. Well, they have verses they point to that are like, if that's your best support. Um, one person told me, um, I don't remember the context, but they, they pointed out that one of the reasons that purgatory is, or the, the apocrypha is held to so tightly is there, there are verses in the apocryphal books that teach, seems to be purgatory, straight up purgatory. So it's sort of like, well, okay, we can't get rid of the apocrypha because that's the only real teaching that we can point to. And they got these other verses that in the, can, the canon um, maybe, maybe not. So we need that. And so uh, it's sort of like, well, we painted ourselves in this corner. We can't, uh, yeah. That's, it's just so much easier to say, I can be wrong. And uh, so as I come up, uh, learn new things, and I realize I got that one really wrong. I mean, you guys who have been here for a while, I've told you about, you know, I, all those bad analogies for the Trinity I've used in my life. Um, I think we all have. So just as you learn more, you get you know better, more fine-tuned. Just admit you're wrong. You don't know everything. Is that too hard? But it is too hard for them. They they want to say that they've never said anything false, and so it's just 
really gets convoluted. They try to get double talk uh, their way out of it. So, um, okay, where we differ. I thought the easiest way to say it is just in the, the solos of the Reformation. Um, we're, we are children of the Reformation as Baptists, even though we're not all Reformed by what the word means now, in the terms of, in the sense of being Calvinist versus non-Calvinist, not all of us are. Um, but Reformed in the sense of what the Reformation was trying to do. Say that the Bible is the authority, not the church is as the authority. That's the whole thing. So sola, um, sola scriptura, um, sola of course meaning only, um, or alone, so scripture alone, uh, Christ alone, grace alone, and faith alone. Those are the four solas that they would scream from the streets as they were uh, in danger of being burnt alive or put in prison. Uh, that's, that was their battle cry. So, um, is it, anyone never seen the solas before? I don't want to belabor it if we all know what they are, we've heard them enough, but good to meditate on um, what each of these mean. It's kind of funny if we say, well, is it faith alone or is it grace alone? Because now you have two things. Well, no, each of them have a, a meaning that you have to know what they mean. You're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, um, and faith in Christ alone, not in Christ and the church, and you only know anything from the Bible alone, not from the pronouncements of the church. Um, this I found very interesting. Kind of a small, I'm always forgetting that it's a small screen. Can you see that in the back? Mm. It's a little... Um, seeing the timeline gives you an appreciation. So, for example, it's not even on there, but uh, Mary, the Immaculate Conception wasn't until the 1800s. Mm. It's not like this goes back to Jesus' time. Like they, like to, they like to talk as though we go all the way back to when Jesus walked the earth. That's not so. Most of the things that we don't agree with them on our later developments that they sort of uh, doubled down on because they were challenged is kind of how it looks. So, uh, I mean, whatever. Latin used in prayer and worship, I don't think that's controversial, but um, this thing that supposedly is so central to what it means to be uh, Catholic that only changed in Vatican II in this last century um, didn't come around for 600 years. Um, prayers dedicated to Mary, saints, that also came around the same time. Kissing the Pope's feet was in the 700s. Veneration um, of cross images and relics, so like you know, kissing the cross and doing all that stuff. That didn't come around until 786. Um, the College of the Cardinals, which ultimately led to uh, the establishment of the Pope as the Supreme Cardinal. Um, Bishop 927. Canonization of dead people as saints wasn't until 900. The attendance at Mass made mandatory, so they have to go every day, right? Did you guys go every day when you were Catholic? Mm -hmm. What was that? My go every day to did. Your Mass? Your mom did? My grandmother did. Grandmother, yeah. We, yeah. we went to Catholic school, so... That counts. You had to go to Mass every day. That and was communion. Not, that wasn't a mandatory thing for almost a thousand years, but you would think that it goes back to the time of Christ. Uh, celibacy, celibacy of priesthood. I think there are a lot of priests who would like to change that one. But yeah. you know, it's been almost a thousand years, um, and uh, over a thousand years after the time of Christ. Uh, this is interesting. Rosaries, the repetitious praying with beads, was invented by Peter the Hermit. Who is that? We don't know. He was a hermit. He never came out. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, I don't know. What it was. Very good. <laughs> But that's who introduced it. So, but I mean, look at that. It's a thousand years later. And uh, what we see people doing now that kind of rubs us the wrong way, it looks like idolatry, or yeah. I, I kind of liken it to almost um, not witchcraft in the satanic sense of the word, but you know, like if you say certain things to Mother Nature, you can, it's like an incantation or a spell. Oh, yeah. Catholics and the Orthodox have that. Like if they say or do certain things, light candles, kiss the icon, whatever it is, that they're obligating the spiritual world to do something for them. And that's kind of like, you know, the rosaries and the and, and you know, you're praying. And it's gotten so silly that you hang a saint on your rear view mirror because, you know, that saint, as they gave their life for the furtherance of the gospel, was really happy that someday they'd be a plastic keychain hanging over somebody's rear view mirror. But that's what they do because it's so supposedly, who's this saint that protects Christian? Christopher. 
St. Christopher protects you when you're driving, yeah, traveling. And, patron saint of travel. Right. So. Is this timeline in the book? Um, it's in this book. Okay. Uh, I could probably, slides, I could post like, these. On, like, because I'm sitting here like. Yeah, yeah, don't worry about writing it down. I will, um, some of these things are Dr. Geisler's, so I'll ask him, hey, is this, uh, he got them somewhere. Yeah. And I just post these, um, just to be sure, because he does, he, he's good about copyright laws. So I'll just make sure. I'm allowed to present it, but actually posting it. Right. So, um. And that is, that, is, that is a good point because that's not a strong suit of mine, uh, you know, getting things up on, you know, if you haven't noticed, I don't post as often as Al does. Um, <laughs> I'm just not as thorough and stuff like that. Um, and so if anybody wants to sort of take on the mantle of class secretary, that would be awesome. You know, and so, yeah, there's a, little, there's a little plug there for a non-paying position. <laughs> All of them are non-paying. So. Um, so yeah, don't worry about writing it down. We'll we'll get it to you some. Awesome. Um, so okay, the rosaries. Are the sale of indulgences. So from 1190 until Luther, they were doing that. So it was time. I mean, that's a long. You, know, you guys know what that is. Yeah. yeah get them out of purgatory. Well, so, an indulgence is um, getting somebody out of purgatory sooner because of some sacrifice you've made, some tribute that you've made in this life. And so what priests, and that's a doctrine that still exists today, but um, for them, they were selling them. So the priests need a little cash. So they're like, tell me about your dead uncle. Mm -hmm. Tell you what, well, you hook me up, and uh, I'll shave a couple decades off of his purgatory sentence. So that was happening. Mm -hmm. Simplify it. But if you ever seen the movie Luther, uh, mm -hmm. it, was, it was formal. It was like there was a table you went to and you would pay, and then you would go up and do your sacrifice after you had paid for your loved ones. And uh, that's what just blew him away, it pushed him over the edge. He saw these people doing something like that and knowing it wasn't going to help their loved ones. And that started him on the road that ultimately you know, was the Reformation. Uh, yeah, so it's a it's a long time. I didn't realize it started so soon. I thought it was like a hundred years before him or something. But they had established it and, and um, maintained it. Um, transubstantiation. You guys know what that is? Mm -hmm. That's um, the the bread and the wine in communion literally becomes the actual blood and flesh, like the meat and the liquid blood of Jesus at communion. The Eucharist is what they call it. It's called it's, it's transubstantiation. These these elements are no longer what they were. They are now, and that's why if you go to a Catholic church and you watch them take um, the, the Eucharist, they uh, they don't do this at every church, but I've always seen it before. They have a uh, stick with like an ashtray on it that goes underneath whenever they're serving mm -hmm. the bread, because God forbid some of Jesus's flesh hit the ground. You you can't have that. That would be horrible. So they're like, you know, making sure nothing hits the ground. And that's why also priests will finish, and they're probably alcoholics too. Uh, they'll always finish the blood because you can't let any of Jesus' blood go unused. And, um, I mean, it's messed up. And it's also, um, I don't actually have a slide for that, so let's talk about it a little bit. Does anybody know the two passages in the Bible that they think say this? Anybody? I mean, the Last Supper, yeah. what did you just say? This is my body. This is my body. You didn't say this is the symbol of my body. Right. This is my body, which is given to you, right? Oh, that's fine. Yeah. And then the other one was when um, Jesus said, this is right before the time that everyone said, you're whacked out, I'm out of here. And a bunch of people left, but the disciples stayed, and Jesus said, well, where are you? Are you going to go to? And they said, no, you're the only one with the words of life. He had just gotten through saying what offended everybody. He said, unless somebody eats my flesh and drinks my blood. So those are the two passages. Now, what would you say to that, using some good Thomistic metaphysics and, and uh, biblical interpretation that we've gone through? Um, what would you say to them? Let's take the one where this is my body. So Jesus is sitting there and says, this is my body which is broken for you. And he passes up. What would be the answer to saying... Well, when he did that, yeah. picture, how do you know it's analogical? I think John's going to say it. Yeah, I was just going to say when he did that, he was his body was still there, so it wasn't him handing himself out. It's just like when we were, we were talking about, hey, we just got through doing a study on uh, attributes of God, 
and we, we talked about how the Bible does not contain in it any description or any rules on how to interpret it. So when the Bible says, uh, when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, it doesn't mean he's made out of yeast and water and eggs. And, um, but we know that. Why? It doesn't tell us what a metaphor is, what an analogical, uh, uh, lang what analogical language is. But we know that because of principles of reality. We're, th we're thinkers. God gave us brains and senses. And that's how we know the world around us. And that's how we make sense of things. So Jesus, in, in his time on earth, and God, as he revealed things in the Old Testament, never stopped to say, I don't literally mean that. Because he, at times when it was obviously a metaphor, he expected his, his people to know that. This is a great example of that. Because he's right there and they're not gnawing on his triceps, the, he expected them to get it. I mean, maybe Judas went over for a bite and he had to smack him or something. But, you know, these disciples got it. That, yeah, okay, he's, metaphorically, this is his body. I, I get it. They got, they got it better than the Catholics do because they were Jewish and they understood the significance of, of breaking bread and whatnot. It was a fellowship. You have fellowship with me. Um, but yes, that's the answer to it. And the same thing when he said, unless you know, people eat my body and eat my flesh and drink my blood, nobody slid his wrist and started sipping. To mention the, the importance of blood and flesh mm -hmm. to the Jewish sacrificial system. Yeah. yeah, it was almost like the emphasis shouldn't have been on eat my blood and my flesh. It's eat my blood and my flesh, not these lambs and these other sacrifices. I'm the one that's going to save you from your sins. So yeah, um, but that is a good example. So trans transubstantiation. Uh, Lutherans. Uh, I grew up Lutheran and a uh, little bit of time in there, Presbyterian, um, actually right before coming here, too. Um, so I know the Reformed world and a lot of love for it, um, although I'm not one. Um, but as Lutherans, we believe in what's called consubstantiation, which it, it remains the bread, but it does become his flesh. It remains the blood, and so they're both there in the Eucharist, which I don't understand, even as a kid when I was getting taught that I'm like, but how is it both? <laughs> I mean, I, I see how it's both figuratively his body and literally the bread. It makes perfect sense. And that's why I've said all along that when I started studying uh, in seminary before, and then I started studying what Southern Baptists believe, I'm like, oh, wow, I guess I've been a Southern Baptist my whole life. because This is just how I've always thought. And this is what that means to be? Okay. I just couldn't get over the whole don't dance thing. <laughs> and, uh, and so I don't have none of that. <laughs> and I'm not of a dancer. It just, it just seems stuffy. So I realized that that has nothing to do with actually being a Southern Baptist. It was just some people in Southern Baptist churches that said that. So anyway, that's any questions on transubstantiation or anything? This is my coming out. <laughs> oh, you're a Catholic? Ten years ago, I became Catholic. It's a long story. Became? Did you, you were not raised Catholic? Though. No. Okay, well, that's rare. So it was more experiential. The first Mass I ever attended... I thought, holy cow. Oops. You're a Hindu? <laughs> that's a, that's a, a North Dakota Norwegian expression. Uh, I thought, boy, us Protestants do not have communion down. Because, see, I wasn't thinking this yet. I had, I had no idea. And when I saw him break the, the whatever they call it, the host... It was powerful. I, it almost There's brought me to tears. Yeah. It was so reverent. And then I thought of the scripture in, in Revelations where it talks about who will open the books or something yeah, like that. The, seals, yeah. uh, the lamb. The lamb who looks like he's been slain or something like that. And I thought, slain, wow, that's it. There's the lamb being broken. So I really had a good experience with that. But here's the thing that, that got to me, because it goes deeper than that. They then take the host, and they put in this special, I don't know what do you call it. Host holder? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The chalice. No, they call it something chalice. else. Oh, no. Uh... Yeah, it has the grass in the front. Yeah. They hold it up. And I know what you're talking about. And they the put it priest, in a special. When we, when we were kids, we were required to go to all of the special 
it's May Days, which is veneration for Mary and so forth. But the priest would come from the back of the church holding this, was like a starburst. Yeah, I can't think gold. what they call that. And they had a glass circle, and within that circle was the host, which represented the body of Christ. Yes, been the, current, the current host. Yes, but we were taught, if you looked at that host, I mean, it's really that you'd be struck dead. As a child, this is what we were told. So, that's so the we were. Covenant, and you could look at it and just want to touch it. It was a relief. Well, my my experience was, they they take that in this star shaped thing, and it has a name, and they put it in a special room, and that becomes the prayer room, so people can come all hours of the day and night, and bow before it, and and they worship. They believe that that host in there is literally the body of Jesus. Mm -hmm. yep. And though I became Catholic, I, I could not overcome that one. Did you actually it take just, a class and everything? Or oh, yeah, I went through the whole kit and caboodle, as they say. Now they're North monsters. Dakota. <laughs> it's the monsters? The monsters. The monsters. The monsters. Yeah. Maybe. It is monsters. <laughs> um... Th that raises a very good point. Uh, my wife and I, uh, at least every Christmas Eve and sometimes for uh, Easter, we actually will go to a Lutheran or Presbyterian or this past year because we were hosting uh, Sophia from Ukraine. We actually went to the Orthodox Church <coughs> for Christmas Eve. The reason is I like, there's something about the reverent manner in which they do their services that I think we lack as Baptists. And so it's sort of like once a year we like to do that, kind of remind ourselves, number one, what we love about being Baptist because it's dull and all these different things. But also, like, it's, you're supposed to, Baptist isn't dull, these things. Are um, there is something, like when we do communion as Baptists, just because we don't believe in con or, we don't believe in any uh, of the um, sacraments, doesn't mean we have to be whatever you know, there can be some more reverence. and uh, This is one of those examples of the body of Christ. We can learn from each other. Now, they're doing it for the wrong reasons, and their belief that causes them to be reverent is false. So, you, know, you don't have to have that in order to, for us to show reverence. Um, not because we're trying to earn anything from God, but it's just it's good for us to have different modes of... Um, uh, it's good to worship God and to commune with God when you're happy, sad, sober, elated, you know, because we, we are, we're not in, uh, impassable, right? Um, we have feelings and emotions, and uh, we're supposed to worship God in all those states. And so I think that's, I think reverence is one of those things that we kind of put on the side because we're, we're really good at jubilation. Uh, we really are. What did I just do? Yeah, okay. Um, <coughs> Very good, to, you know, to say, that's one of the reasons why, you know, if I come up here and say, the Catholic Church is the whore of Babylon, <laughs> you know, you would have been like, mm, I'm not going to tell them I was a Catholic for a little while, and um, not to mention it's wrong, it's not incorrect to say that. Um, we have to show the grace that we're, or graciousness, I think, that we're not shown <coughs> by Catholics. Most of the time, you know, we're looked at as inferior Christians or or substandard or whatever. We don't want to be guilty of the same thing, right? saying things a little with maybe more volume than we really should. Even if it's true, we can turn the volume down a little bit on it as we're talking to people who don't believe um, the right way. Um, okay. Another uh, timeline of the cat. Now, this is the timeline of the Roman Catholic Church, in which case uh, we would agree with all of them up to a certain point. Uh, but the New Testament church is uh, the disciples. They're running things. The sub-apostolic church is the same church, but it's when they started handing off things because the disciples were dying or they were planting churches. And, but it's the same time period, basically. Uh, the early post-apostolic church um, would be like the 100s and the 200s before Constantine. Uh, which I don't have a slide for that, but we should probably mention Constantine. That's a um, the pre-medieval pre church. So what came around uh, uh, in this, those first years, um, one bishop over elders in each church. 
So there's a structure to it, nothing wrong with that. I mean, Preacher Mike's in charge, right? We have no problem with the buck stops here. Uh, that's basically what that was born of, rightly so. Um, the pre-medieval church, regional bishops were over the area churches. The medieval church, this is when you start getting into the, the, uh, the rise of the supremacy of the bishop of Rome, that's the pope. So there were, church, there were bishops over these uh, geographic areas, and it's one of the reasons why the Orthodox Church said, you know, forget y'all, we're, we're going our own ways, because the Pope in Rome was trying to tell all these Greek-speaking churches what's what. And they're like, well, look, we respect you. You come from the line of Peter, supposedly. Um, but, no, you can't tell us that we have to do it in Latin, or you can't tell us it's not your right to do that. And so that's, that was the tension that led to their, their split. Um, and then the modern church, one infallible bishop of Rome over all churches. Um, and that would be modern church, meaning uh, you could, that would apply to pre-Reformation, too. Um, so that, that's a long period of time, the modern church. Um, so, okay, I'll go back to that. Does it, anybody not know, I'm going to say it anyway, so I guess I shouldn't ask, but what happened in the 300s with Constantine? The kind of the timeline. I just saw the movie, the um, Paul the Apostle, uh, Apostle of Christ. Really good. I heard some some people not give it a good review. I was like, what did you want it to be? I mean, it was great. Um, it was just look. This is what happened when Nero was burning us at stakes and um, you know running for our lives, but still standing strong. And I thought it was great. Uh, I only saw one thing in there I didn't agree with, but it was an apologetic issue of when was the Book of Acts actually written? And whatever. It doesn't matter. We don't know. It wasn't dated. So. Um, but that was when Nero was, you know, putting Christians on stakes, <clears throat> dousing them in oil and lighting them up while they're alive, just to light the streets. They were torches oh, to light the streets, and that's that's what happened. Nero was horrible. He did all kinds. Of, he would take women and children and put them into the the arena and let hungry animals devour them, and everyone would cheer. All they did was just get eaten. So they would take crowds of Christians and usher them in. And, these animals would tear that crowd of Christians limb to limb, and um, people would yay. So it was um, it was messed up. So Christianity grew and thrived in that kind of environment for 300 years. It got you know easier and easier to be Christian, granted, but to the point where in the 300s uh, Constantinople, Constantine uh, was the emperor of Rome, and he had a formal official conversion converted to Christianity. There's a lot of reason to think he wasn't born again. It was more of a uh, political move or whatever. I think his mom got saved or something was the reason. But the point was, he then made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, and everybody in Rome was instantly a Christian. <laughs> Obviously they weren't, right? right. But that was the, um, that's when uh, Rome became a Christian uh, empire. Uh, and around the same time, the Turks, uh, the no, I'm sorry, that's fast forward. Um, the Visigoths were starting to really gain in strength. They were the barbarians, the pagans, and they were posing a lot of military threat to the western side of the empire. So Constantine picked up and moved the capital to Constantinople. He went to Turkey, and I don't know what it was called before that. Now it's Istanbul. Uh, you know the song. Uh, so. That, that was the move from west to east. So what happened was the west was left unprotected, and not long after that the Visigoths sacked Rome and actually took over, and they, uh, the western empire fell. So you had eastern, the eastern empire that was still the Roman empire that, um, that was run from Constantinople. The, uh, so what happened was that is the tradition that became eastern orthodoxy. They spoke Greek. It was in Constantinople. If you look at pictures of Constantinople, it looks very much like a Russian or a Greek uh, architecture. Um, that's where the East came from, Eastern Church. So it started to thrive. Um, the Western Church still survived, and so ultimately the Visigoths were beaten, actually converted, and then they became, um, uh, it was still part of the empire, but no power at all. But Rome was the where the Pope, that was his um, territory, we should call it. Um, so that was how East and West have began to have separate histories. And then from that point, they started to kind of go on a trajectory that 
pull them further and further apart. They practice Christianity slightly differently, and of course all the battles of the Pope saying something in the Eastern Empire is like, what are you talking about? You guys fell. We're the only ones who you know, tell you know, they're not telling us what to do. That's basically what what it was. It was a political battle. Um, interestingly, this is a, a, a missions statement I'll make here, and a cultural one. If you've ever been tempted, as I have, and I'm sure you have, especially in the last nine years or so, to think that we're done as a, as a, mm -hmm. as a country in terms of mm -hmm. culture, what we yeah. really are, mm -hmm. it's been really hard, hasn't it? I mean, yeah. We, we seem to be getting our heinies whipped at every turn as conservative Christian people. We're losing everything, it seems like. Now it's getting better now, but it's been bad. Um, the Visigoths made us look like Pollyanna. It, it, these guys were, uh, they were the, the cliche Vikings, or um, uh, I, I've never seen the show, but like Game of Thrones looks like from the, from the previews, very violent, very, these guys were just, they were nasty, nasty people, nasty, nasty culture, child sacrifice, the whole thing was horrible. They got saved because missionaries didn't give up on them. The same thing with the Celts, uh, the same thing with, uh, well, you know, uh, Saint, uh, uh, who's the beer saint? The beer saint? Beer? B E B E R. Yeah, it, 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 Saint Heineken, right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's his name? March. Patrick? Yeah, see, I'm so... Oh, <laughs> the beer. <laughs> Saint Patrick. Um, the, the guys who kidnapped him, the Irish, oh. um, and did all those horrible things to him, then he escaped and then came back and witnessed to him, mm. they were horrible. That anything that we can say about the United States, and how bad it is, or Western Europe, they were worse. And in those contexts, missionaries and, and churches didn't give up. And they built up what is the Western world that we're trying to preserve now. So that learning that and studying that, I, I got to a point where I'm like, look, if God wants, if Jesus wants to come back and it's over, that's up to him. It's not our, it's not our place to say these are the end times. It's not our place. That's God's choice when he comes back. You guys realize every generation since Jesus thought they were the last generation? So maybe we are, maybe we are. I do believe there are some signs that are very interesting, but that's not our job. Our job is to be salt and light. And if God so wishes, he will let that salt and light work. Mm -hmm. And culture will change again. If it happened once... If the Declaration of Independence can be written once, it can happen again. Mm -hmm. And I have to believe that. And I'm just going to keep fighting for it. And if God wants it to, you know, for us to go away because of some plan that he has, that's his choice. Right. But he has told us, be salt, be light, fight against evils, obey your government, all the things that we know make up what it means to be a, a conservative-minded Christian about culture and politics and all that. Um, that. That's what we have to fight for mm -hmm. in the world sharing the gospel, if the whole country got saved, that'd be a lot easier, and then we would all agree, but that ain't going to happen, so uh, we had to still be salt and light. So, um, any questions on the Eastern Church, because that'll come up a little bit later when we talk about the Orthodox Church, but that's the root of Eastern, Western, and Orthodox, and Roman Catholic. Okay, the million dollar question, in my opinion, like where, if you were to boil everything down, Mary, Purgatory, all the things that we just don't agree on, they all come back to this question of authority. Is it, is it scripture? Is it the Bible that's the ultimate authority? Or is it the magisterium? Magisterium would include uh, popes, bishops, writings from the past, creeds, everything that makes up their body of, um, of knowledge or, or commentaries on the Bible. They equate with the Bible. So what they say Paul meant is as authoritative as what Paul said. That's what they're saying. Um, everything boils down to that. So because my wife grew up Catholic, we have friends on Facebook that are Catholic. Like I said, these guys are uber Catholics. You know, 12 kids, the whole nine. You know, one of them is 17 kids. They're good Catholics. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, or Mormish, or rabbits. I don't know. Wow. <laughs> it's cool. There's nothing wrong with having a big family, but it's certainly not a mandate from God. Wow. So, um, <laughs> all the women in the class are going, oh, wow. Um, so 
this is the world that my wife grew up in, and we still have a lot of friends. She went to an all-Catholic high school. She was the only one of only two Protestants in her class. And so when we get go, go up there and get back together with her friends, we hear it. You know, they're always trying to. Um, so one of them posted this meeting. So I'll let you read it for a second. While it's making you some picture. Can you read that bottom part? When you have cried a spirit. You got that? Yep. So I'll read it just real quick. <clears throat> Here she begins when that special moment when you have greater spiritual insight than the apostles, disciples, apostolic fathers, the church, and the magisterium because you have a Bible that they wrote, compiled, and gave to you. Okay, you see what you're saying? It's, mm -hmm. it's a pithy statement. Mm -hmm. What would you say to it? Where are the mistakes? Well, first of all, do you agree with it? Does anybody agree with that? <laughs> I think so. Um, where did, does he go wrong? Use some of our uh, roadrunner tactics here, if you remember from. <coughs> well, the disciples did. But under the authority, the inspiration of God, that's really the Who's to say what he says, not here? What he wrote. Well, I, I, I think you have the right target. The, the first thing that stuck out to me is, well, wait a second. You think that I'm supposed to understand, um, uh, let's see, I'm supposed to understand the Apostle Disciples, I'm supposed to understand all these, what these guys wrote? So you trust me that I can understand their writings, but I'm not supposed to be able to write, read the Bible and understand it. Which is it? Because if I can understand what you're saying, then I can understand what the Apostles were saying in the Bible. If I can't understand what the Apostles are saying, so why did you write it? Why don't you only go around saying things orally? Because nobody can understand anything that's written. You know, it's, it's self-defeating. It's the roadrunner. Yeah, you're right. That, it, that can't be true if it's true. Because if his premise is true, then I should reject the conclusion that I'm not supposed to be able to um, understand. So that, I think, is the most egregious thing. You expect everybody to understand what you're saying. You're constantly telling us what's what. Mm -hmm. um, but why is it then that we can't understand what Jesus said? or Paul, or Peter, or John, what's the difference? If you say that they're all equally authoritative, and, I ought to, and I'm reading you, because most of you are dead, so I'm reading you from before uh, in time, Paul and these guys are dead too, why can't I read them and understand it? It's just, it's self-contradictory. Either you trust me or you don't. It doesn't matter if you trust me. Either I can or I can't understand is the point. Um... Well, I'm not going to go deep into it, but Thomas Aquinas is the philosopher. Uh, we just got through doing a series um, on Aquinas. The interesting thing about Southern Evangelical, where I work and graduated from, is that we are Thomistic in our philosophy. We believe he got his philosophy right. He was Catholic, of course. Well, in the modern sense of the word, it was before the Reformation. Um, he did not believe uh, that Mary was sinless. He thought, how could she be sinless? And he argued for her that she couldn't be. Right. Um, so it wasn't Catholic in the modern sense of the word. But he was Catholic. So why do we follow him uh, in, a, in his philosophy? Because we think he's right about how to understand the world. So here's the thing. Aquinas, what is absolutely core to Aquinas, you guys remember the two things that you have to know something? This is just a little bit pop quiz. A human knows things because of two reasons. You have what and you have what? <laughs> I'd be surprised if you remember it. But we have senses, we hear, taste, smell, touch, and we have intellect. So we, we know there's an external world. This, the, the, to summarize the philosophy of Aquinas, modern philosophy says, wow, this is, wow, how, I have to explain how I know there's a bottle of water right there. So they start getting all these weird things that most of us get annoyed with about philosophers is that. Like, well, how do I know there's a bottle there? Aquinas said, that's how I know there's a bottle there. I'm touching it, I'm feeling it, I'm tasting it. And if you're, if this bottle isn't enough to convince you that there's a bottle there, 
then my argument that there's a bottle there is going to be even worse. You're, you're hopeless. If you give up your senses and your intellect, you're only going to get to where we are today, postmodernism. Um, so Aquinas was really good. The, th the interesting thing, though, is Aquinas said you can start from sensible reality and your intellect, and you can reason all the way from pure actuality, simplicity, remember all that? You can reason doing just philosophy all the way up to God that has all the attributes of the God of the Bible, and that the Bible is the Word of God. You can reason up to that. Well, Catholics, you, fo you follow Aquinas. If you believe that the human can be trusted with his senses and his intellect to know all that, why can't he use his senses and his intellect to read the Bible? You've just undermined your, the metaphysics that you use to prove Christianity in trying to keep people from thinking they can interpret the Bible. Um, granted that whenever you talk about Thomas Aquinas, it gets real deep because he was, he's one of those guys who didn't know how smart he was. So he would write stuff down that he thought was like a summary. You know, this is, this is simple, they'll understand that. And his students looked at it and go, what are you talking about? We don't get it? He was just a, he was a nerd extraordinary. It was awesome. Um, so you have to study him for like a long time to know what he's even saying. But he's saying some really good things. The Roman Catholic Church, um, that's what I just said. They say that you can't understand the Bible, but they think that you can. The individual can understand what the Roman Catholic Church has said about the Bible. So mm -hmm. there's a self contradiction there. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that one of our professors said in class, and he didn't think it was that profound. But you could hear the sound of my jaw hitting the floor. It was. I was like, that is awesome. If you look at the be the parts of the letters of Paul that we all skip the beginning parts and the end parts, right? Because it's like, well, say hi to Joe for me. And we'll, we'll do that. There's a lot in there. Who does he address the actual epistles to? It's not to the bishop at the church of. It's to the saints. He was writing the New Testament yeah. to us, right. people who aren't at that level. Well, Catholic Church, if... Paul thought that the people could understand what he was saying. Who are you to say, no, 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 let, let me step in. You know, it's, um, th and we know that because at other times he would say, to the saints, and also tell the bishop, or tell the deacons. <coughs> so we know that he, what he meant when he said saints versus the leadership. Uh, that's just a small little thing that you're like, wow, that's, that settles it in my mind. If the Bible itself was uh, meant to be read and understood by, you know, common folk then, okay, we can read it and understand it ourselves. So to me, Aquinas, the self-contradiction of, you know, you understand what we're reading, but you can't understand, or writing, you can't understand what they wrote, and then the fact that the Bible was written to normal people. Those are three, uh, I think, nails in the coffin. Um, okay, salvation. Let me go quickly now, because I want to get it. We have 25 minutes. By grace through faith, or mediated through the sacraments. So they say you're saved by grace, God's grace. But that grace is doled out to us through the seven sacraments. Primarily, the Eucharist. They think that is the ultimate, participating in communion, that is the, the ultimate of the sacraments. And then, of course, there's, uh, there's marriage, there's um, the confession. Um, confirmation. Confirmation. Uh, per, or, Baptism. Um, what's the one where you feel really, really bad? Contrition. Um, Baptism. Yeah. yeah, baptism. Yeah. yeah. Um, so... That's how God's grace. So you notice, this is uh, true of in reading the Bible for yourself or being saved. I always looked at it like this because I saw people in my life that were born again, and but they were Catholic, or they became Catholic, mm -hmm. or they were, and then they got born again, and they went back to Catholic. Is usually how it happens. I have this image of like um, the Catholic Church discovering one of their people is born again and has an actual relationship with God. They, they have this, like, oh, hey, that's great. Like, here's the person, and here's Jesus. I'm so glad the two of you have gotten to know each other. Now, let me exactly. talk to me here. I'll tell them what you're saying. Mm. Let me exactly. get in between you as quickly as possible and as effectively as possible, because heaven forbid you can have a direct relationship with this God of the universe you just accepted into your heart. That's what all this is about, in my yes. opinion. It's control. It is. It's like, yeah, God's grace, but we got it. We'll, 
bless them God's grace. Come on Sunday. Actually, come every day and take communion and, and uh, tell me what's what. Uh, That's why they're not allowed to read the Bible. When, well, when, I, when I was growing up in Catholic school, we never had the Bible, ever. And we had a crucifix above the chalkboard with the figure of Christ on it, and I never knew who he was. Mm -hmm. And I went there eight years. And when I became a, <coughs> a born-again Christian at 28, I started to read the Bible at home by myself, and I remember my first thought was, why didn't anybody ever tell me this? Mm -hmm. I was reading wow. just very simplistic things because that's all I could absorb at the time. Mm -hmm. I was a babe in Christ, and I had never heard it. But it was a way of the church uh, controlling the people. Therefore, they dictate what you believe, what you do, blah, blah, blah. Never read the Bible, we'll tell you. At one point, they called it a dangerous book. Because if people start reading it for themselves, yes. it's going to cause all kinds of trouble. And then they pointed to the Reformation being fragmented and people arguing in pubs and all that. Said, See, look, it's a dangerous book. You, you can't be trusted with it. And if, you're, um, if you have family members who are Catholic and th now you have broken away from the Catholic Church, there is shock and dismay and anger. Although they're not really practicing their faith, although they say they're Catholic, they're not doing anything that the Catholic Church would dictate. Yeah. As long as you don't say you're something else. Yes. Yeah. And certainly not a Baptist. Oh, yeah. I well, mean, that's the only worst thing would be a Lutheran or Presbyterian. <laughs> that really that's hurts bad. when you say that. Um, now, the interesting thing that he pointed out that I think is fair to say, it's not so that Catholics are not encouraged to, well, are said don't read the Bible. They're told, don't interpret the Bible. Read it. Feel free. In fact, modern Catholics are, because of the pressures that we're putting on them as evangelicals, and people keep leaving the Catholic Church to come to Baptists and other churches, they, they're starting to talk differently, even though they mean the same thing. So, yeah, you feel free to read the Bible yourself, but don't for a second think you can understand it. Read it, and remember what we told you it meant. And if you forgot what we said, just come back and we'll remind you. Well, that's what the liturgy is all about. It, you know, just, we'll tell you what it means. Don't. But sure, here, read it. It's fine. You know, it's um, it's a little different. It used to be more along those lines. Um, my yeah, mom grew up Catholic, and some of the things that they were told, I was like, oh, mom, I'm surprised you're even like remotely Christian. Uh, she didn't get saved till after leaving the Catholic Church. But um, yeah, it's very authoritative. Um, Eric, my experience was with. Uh the church in Wichita, Kansas. The Catholic Church in Wichita, yeah. Kansas? Yeah. And what, what do they call the diocese? Mm -hmm. the, that whole region? Because yeah. there's uh, the Catholic Church there is big, very big. Really? I wouldn't picture it in Wichita. But yeah. But it's a, it's a totally, it's not a, like anything she just described. Like, for instance, I was in two Bible studies that like we, you said, they're starting to do that more. Yeah, yeah, I think they're more open to it now. A but. young priest gave a sermon. I can't remember what they called them. I don't, maybe they homilies. called them homilies. homilies. And he, he encouraged the people to read the Bible. And he actually stood up in front of the people, and he had several Bibles in his hands. And what he was encouraging was, here are several different translations. So... What I learned is that this diocese in Wichita is very different than the typical traditional uh, in Roman practice, Catholic. That more, but I guarantee yeah. you that, that even in that diocese, if someone were to go up to him and say, I think this passage means this, in contradiction to what the church teaches, yeah. he, they would say, it's not your place to, to interpret that. Read it so that you know why we've told you that this is, maybe. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I'm, my wife grew up Catholic, but it was a, a charismatic Catholic movement in Michigan called the Word of God Community. Um, and so she actually got saved because of, she went up to a priest and said, how do I become a Christian? He said the gospel to her. Wow. Yeah, he actually said, you know, wow. pray to receive Christ, he paid for your sins, all that. She, she got saved at seven years old because a priest told her. 
that was a fluke because uh, now he had a background that was a little bit more normal. Um, although he he didn't grow up Catholic, I think maybe there's some of the there was a vestige of um, evangelicalism in him still. So yes, you'll find uh, some, but the, the actual teaching of the Catholic Church is individuals are not able to and allow or allowed to interpret themselves. Um, but it's going to be it's going to get more and more dangerous if they keep letting people read it. Um, I'm encouraging them to read it. Um, okay, so we think it's faith only, okay. sola fide. The Catholic Church says, yeah, you're saved by faith and works. Okay. Saved by faith, but your works are part of that salvation. So they will affirm, yeah, yeah, you're saved by faith, that's what the Bible says. But it also says, and then they'll usually quote James, um, and say that you're saved by faith and works. Uh, God's grace is mediated through the seven sacraments that they're in control of. Um, in, in the evangelical uh, church, we have two different concepts. One's called justification, and that's when you're saved, you are 100% justified before God. He sees you, he sees Jesus, and you're going to heaven. Because he can't let any sin into heaven. So even one sin is too much. So he looks at us, and he sees sinlessness, because he sees Jesus. That's justification. Then there's, after you're saved, if you're justified, you have a lifetime of being sanctified. And that's where God disciplines you, you practice the fruits of the Spirit, the disciplines of the Spirit, you grow in Christ. That's, that's what we would call sanctification. Now the Catholic Church says that, yeah, we believe in justification and sanctification, but they're the exact same thing. So you are justified by all that growing that we're doing, that we think is just growth, maturity. They're calling that salvation. It's a process, not an event. So sometimes they can talk about it in ways that we're like, yeah, that's cool. Other times they'll talk about it where we, you know, no, that's, that's cultic. Um, that's why it's confusing, because they'll use the same words, but mean something different. But what they really mean is that salvation is a process, and it's something that the church is pretty much in charge of. <coughs> and they, they dole it out through the sacrament. Eric, so if it's a process, what, where's the line that you cross over that you... you purgatory. If there are only two ways to skip out of so purgatory. So if you start the process, then you're, you're, you escape hell, right. but then it's whether or how long you're in purgatory. Right. right? And if to you finish, finish the process, then, then you go heaven. straight to heaven. Okay. Time out. That's, that's not correct. Which part? What, um, you, you don't... You have kind of a conditional salvation. I use that term. I'm not sure it's a word space would probably be some, yeah. Because if you commit a mortal sin, you can be, you know, a, a Christian, born again or whatever. You're doomed to hell. Right. That's the issue. So you never really have the assurance of being saved as we think of being right. saved. Right. You talk about the eternal uh, security of heaven. Right, but they you can don't be have certain that. they're going to hell. But well, they, they can't can be, be certain, certain they're going to heaven until they've right. purged the if they, purgatory. Yes, because those people who commit mortal sins can't go to purgatory. Correct. They're immediately right. they, in hell. they're going to hell. Right. Right. I mean, purgatory solves the problem of what do you do if you For commit a minor sins. sin? Yeah, a right. minor sin. You can't go to heaven because you're in a state of sin. So that's the big issue. You you never have assurance. As a Catholic, because you could always do something. Unless you're wrong. martyred. Pardon me? If you're martyred, well, that's you go true. right to heaven. Martyred for the church, you go right to heaven. <laughs> but, well, there are two, I can't remember what it is. There's martyrdom and the second one that are the only two ways that you directly go to heaven without. I don't remember around. the second one. Yeah, I can't remember. Um, but you, you always have this notion of walking on eggs because if you don't go to church on Sunday, that's a mortal sin. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I mean, okay. It's you don't go to church for this reason or that reason. I guess some of it could be okay, but some of it can't be okay. So you don't know if you did an okay or you yeah, didn't do an okay. image of God up there with his big thumb ready right. to just squash you. <clears throat> and so you get even into the, the thoughts, you know, your thoughts. You can yeah. commit sin by having... She just said, you know, yeah, if, you, if you hate, right. it's the same as right. murder. So... You never have that assurance that you're saved. I guess what you can say is, as a Catholic, you don't have assurance of salvation, but you can have assurance of damnation. Mm. Yes, if you get to you the can, point of, if you've I don't care anymore, then 
you've flipped the switch and yeah, you're going to be damned. But as far as knowing right. you're going to heaven, yeah, there right. it's well, I don't know. The church has to keep giving me this, these means of grace and well, then you I'll have to out. go to confession and then right. you you build it up. You go to communion, you get the other sacraments, and so then contrition you, afterwards. Yeah, you yeah. kind of build up your points, mm -hmm. and and that's what it's about. And that's I guess because it's a process. A issue. You can never say I'm I'm going to heaven. It no, is that's right. Can't. Because that's you right. might commit a mortal sin later. Yes. You know, where, yes. Or the church might decide to hold back on some of the means of grace. It's up to them. So you don't know for sure. Uh, yeah, it's it's very uh, um, oppressive it, to, to it walk around very, that uh, it, It's it is. Um, I mean, take divorce people. I mean, divorce is not really allowed in the Catholic Church, although there's ways that people... And if you annul it. Yeah, an annulment or whatever, but then you have, you know, a wife or a husband potentially gets remarried, and, well, they're living in sin now, so... Uh, My aunt and uncle were both divorced, and they, their whole yeah. life, were not allowed to take communion. Right. And, They've uh, changed it. It used to be right. that you were... Not in the Catholic Church. Now that you can you just be in the church, you can't get, get communion. communion and yeah. right. and I remember yeah. growing up thinking that. Everything I saw growing up, I'm like, wow, I didn't really want to be Catholic. It's I'm changed a lot since Vatican II, but it's still... Well, this is all post-Vatican II, yeah. yeah. Um, Norm says in his, um, <clears throat> his talk that not as much change in Vatican II as they like to try and sell. It, uh, okay, so Latin is not the, the official language right. of the Mass. That's about the most visible thing. Right. Um, so... Yeah, Vatican II changed some things, but not radical changes of what we're talking about, at least, like the seven sacraments and justification and sanctification being actually what salvation is. It's a process. So, yeah, but you're right. You can have the whole way they split up two types of sin. Um, you can be sure of hell, but assurance of heaven is uh, not until. Uh, they do know, they would say this as soon as you're in purgatory, you know you're going to go to heaven. Purgatory is not an eternal state. Um, so, if you're in there in purgatory, you know, no matter how long it is, it's still not eternity. So, the, you know you're going to go to heaven. The big but with that is, as a Catholic, if you put your, your, your mind in the frame of mind of a Catholic, purgatory is pain and suffering. Purgatory isn't like being on the beach, not being with God, but you're okay. So, it's kind of a, a hell you get out of. Maybe not as severe or permanent, but... It's nothing that gives you comfort knowing, well, I'm going to go to purgatory. So I, right. That's why they want to do indulgences to get sure. them out quicker. Sure. But it's not, it, the uh, pain and suffering is not torture, it's purging. So it's with love in mind is the idea that God is doing this to burn off all that yes. stuff that you don't want in your eternal state anyway. Yes. So you just have to keep burning it off. Um, it's not like in hell where it's right. punishment because of what you've uh, chosen. So. But all of this, the mortal sin, the venial sin, uh, purgatory uh, indulgences, that all flies in the face of saved by grace completely. It just, in my mind, after I became a Christian, it was I'm saved by grace and I'm free. Well, there's a contradiction that I see with the Catholic Church because they're saying we believe in Christ, we believe in his blood, we believe that you're saved. However, you have all these things that you have to do, but that's not the truth. The truth is you're saved by grace, period, right? They don't believe that. And, and they would say you're being saved by grace is the process. But we were even using the word as an event. I am saved, or I was saved by God's grace. They would say, no, no, you're being saved by God's grace, and His grace is being given to you by these. Um, I never heard character. that said either. <laughs> well, they're not usually that precise, but that's... It's, it's being in a, a state of grace is, is the term that you yeah, use, that'd be which you, you have to maintain the state of Through grace. You can boot, yes. I, I have a, lose it. a Catholic friend back in Wichita, and I'm happy to say I've pretty much Protestantized him. Mm -hmm. We have good talks, even on the phone to this day. And 
this whole thing about security that we were talking about, mm -hmm. that's his biggest disappointment. Mm -hmm. He's a, he's, um, uh, what do they call him? He's like an usher or, or he'll go to funeral, he goes to all the funerals and he's like a doorkeeper. So he welcomes, he welcomes in and he's one of these kind of guys that's kind of bold and forward-like and he's big. He's a monstrous kind of man, but kind of a gentle spirit. So the people come in and he'll say stuff like, oh, she's in a better place, or he's in a better place. Well, they're asking him not to say that anymore <laughs> because that's not the Catholic thing. Yeah, it's a worse it place for the time being. It shows that I'm getting through to him. Yeah. <laughs> and he likes that's talking why, to me. It's, it's that's why the pretty interesting. Such a battle cry because, um, yeah, when you read it, you can't read the book of Colossians yeah. where Paul clearly says you have two choices. You can obey the law perfectly or you can accept grace completely. There is no middle ground. Fabulous. It's awesome. I love it. It's <laughs> like, every time you try to add something to grace, you just uh, crucify Jesus all over again. It's mm -hmm. uh, very clear. Um, so, I, I, and my, I just have a question. It might be for y'all too. I work with a lot of Catholics. Just about my whole place is Catholic. How? How do you? How do you tell? I mean, how do you even remotely? I mean, my boss he didn't even know Acts was a book of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Didn't know. But they because they don't read their Bible. No. They don't, do they even know so what they believe? They're told not. Yeah, yeah, they go to mass in, in every now and then. Right. No, they're they're encouraged to know. They're, they're more dedicated to the actions of their faith, I would say. Yeah, they, but yeah, the, the interesting thing about the average Baptist knows the Bible really well. Yes. Yes. The average Baptist preacher is not very educated in theology. It's exactly opposite for Catholics. The average Catholic has no clue. Right. Why did any of that? Whatever. You tell me to sit, stand. Yeah, right. exactly. I'll do it. No problem. Um, they have no idea why. But the average priest, they are really well educated. They're not allowed to be a priest without studying Thomistic metaphysics and Plato and all the other. These guys are. So it's like the inverse. Um, which one of the things I want to try and do in evangelical circles is just keep encouraging us to look. I want, again, the pastors to be looked at as, yeah, they're the smartest guy. Because they've had to, study. in order to, to preach the word of God, I'm sorry, I just don't like the I'm called. I don't need to get educated. I believe in being called and beginning right away as you start getting your education. But the Bible has so many warnings against those of us who teach. Don't you? You better know that what you're teaching, is, yeah. as far as you can understand it, is correct. Ignorance is not an option. Being ignorant of a fact here and there, just loosely handling it. Being dynamic is not what you, how you know you're called to preach. That's how you know you're called to be a motivational speaker or a cult leader or who knows what. It does not mean you're called to preach. And our culture keeps rewarding people who only meet that minimum standard. We ought to be up in arms when we teach. We don't have that here. Our pastor Mike's awesome. When we, ought to, when we go to a church and we have someone up there who starts to make fun of seminary, I didn't need that. He's going to just get up and walk out. You, I'm supposed to come every week and learn something from somebody who just told me that not only doesn't he know it, but he refuses to learn it. Go find a church. There's plenty of churches in Charlotte. You know, come to First Baptist. We got a guy who actually went to school and started a school, right? So, um, yeah, I, that's just a personal hot button for me that in our evangelical circles, it's gotten to that point where, oh yeah, don't go study theology because you're gonna like somehow your faith will get dead. Shouldn't. I mean, yeah, there probably are schools that, but you mean getting to know God better is going to hurt your relationship with God? How is that possible? Mm. Um, and the warnings that are in Scripture for anyone who's teaching, you better make sure you're right. Okay, Virgin Mary in four minutes. <laughs> I love introducing things like, hey, impassibility, you guys want to bring that up now? <laughs> um, okay, here's my view. Mary was a godly woman. And if there was any justice in the afterlife, she would stand there at the heaven's gate to slap every Catholic who was about to walk into eternal paradise. Because she would be angry 
that people were talking about her in this worshipful manner. Yeah. She was a godly woman, and she does not deserve to be uh, gone down in history as one of the biggest, worst idols ever. That's my non-truthful uh, anecdote. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I'm serious. It's the stuff they do. Now, they, the thing about Catholics, I'll say, if you say something like, why do you guys worship Mary? We don't worship Mary. <laughs> sure sounds like you worship Mary. No, we venerate Mary. Well, what's the difference? Well, veneration is this and this. They have it all figured out to a science. It, it's like talking to a philosopher, right? They're always, no, no, nuance this, nuance that. There is an answer for everything that you'll bring up to them. So you ask about you know, how to talk to average Catholics, how you talk to them. Just try to get them into the Bible and talk about authority, and whether or not you can read the Bible. And they'll say, well, I'm not supposed to. Well, you can just, well, they think that you understand when they tell you not to. So use that type of argumentation to say, read the Bible. And yes, you can understand it. And if they tell you you can't, then it's self-contradictory so you know that you're safe to provide. So let them start reading. But when you talk to a priest or someone who studies theology, they have it all figured out. It is, it's, your head spins. So I got to a point one time where I was talking to someone who had become Catholic um, that was trained at our school. And I was like, okay, I just gave an objection. I think it was about Mary. And they gave me the answer. It was a technical answer. And then they moved on. I said, wait a second. Just because you have an answer doesn't mean it's the right answer or even a reasonable answer. They seem to stop at, we have an explanation for every single thing we believe. No, you're supposed to ask the next question is, is it a good explanation? And I would say, with the Mariology, no. Every time they try to say, here's why we do it, here's what we're doing, I'd say, well, that's not good. It's a bad example. So, her, things like her perpetual virginity, meaning that she's still a virgin, she never had any other children. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible says that Jesus had brothers. Um, immaculate conception. Uh, you know, most people think that that means the birth of Jesus or the conception of Jesus. That's not what it means. Mary was immaculately conceived, not in sin. Um, it's interesting to learn that, because the immaculate conception is uh, normally present. It's really, yeah, Jesus was born, you know, miraculously and sinless. No, they didn't mean Mary was born sinless. She wasn't born a virgin, but God gave her supernatural grace and withheld the sinful nature to her. Uh, so they have other ways of explaining it, uh, but uh, that's a tough one. Since G when Mary was talking, um, she said, my Savior, God my Savior, when she was told about uh, Jesus being in her, or maybe being in her. So um, I think Mary got it. She knew she needed a Savior. Um, the uh, other thing, too, is the reason they say that she had to be immaculately conceived, one of the reasons, is that Jesus couldn't gestate inside of a womb that was scarred by the sinful nature, because then it would be passed on to him. So. Um, but then why didn't Mary's mom have to be sinless for her to be sinless in her mother's womb? You see the infinite regress yeah. problem. Well, what about Mary's grandma? Great-grandma. Yeah. Great-great-grandma. I mean, where do you stop? Isn't it just simpler to say, yeah, it's possible to be born sinless in a womb? And that's what Jesus was. Because it says he was sinless. It never says that about Mary. So, um, sinlessness of Mary, um, they, uh, they basically say, um, what's the passage that says, uh, full of grace, I think is what it was, which means that she is just the embodiment of God's grace. Like there's no sin even in her, in her being. Uh, the bodily assumption, they don't think she died um, because it'd be beneath her you know, to die. Because um, She also speaks to God on our behalf. Of course, the Bible says Jesus speaks to the Father on our behalf, but uh, they say that Mary speaks to God. And veneration could mean worship, but it means great respect, or uh, you venerate a king, you venerate someone with authority, they venerate him. But when you see it in practice, it looks an awful lot like worship. You know, there's something only God deserves. Like um, in a lot of Catholic churches, you'll have a statue of, of um, God the Father and a statue of Mary holding Jesus. Sometimes not even holding Jesus. And at weddings, you know, they'll present flowers to both statues. And it's equal size, equal. It's like, it sure looks an awful lot like you're trying to equate Mary to yes. God the Father. I know you have an explanation about why you're not doing that but it really does look like that's what you're doing. And I'm not the only one that's confused. Your parishioners are confused, too, because they keep talking about Mary like she's 
something more than human. Uh, you hear average Catholics talk about Mary. They talk about her like, uh, you know, she's going to hook him up because she's you know, God's, God's mom. And, and you know, it got so bad. Did you know that um, Muhammad, he thought, and uh, Donald talked about this, but when he, he thought that the, the um, Trinity was God the Father having sex with God, um, with Mary, to produce Jesus the Son. So, Father, Mary, Jesus. That's what they thought the minute. But you can kind of see where they got that. People were talking like this already, and it was just starting to be around them. So, that's one reason we know Islam's false, because if Allah can't make any mistakes, and he revealed something demonstrably false to Muhammad, then, okay, Allah was not the one talking to you. It was probably Lucifer. You know, it's one of the reasons we know that he did not get a real revelation, because he's got facts like that just incorrect. But, um, yeah, it's um, the Mary. Like I say, we talk about Mary as Protestants like we talk about a lot of people in the Bible. We can learn a lot from her humility, her willingness to accept what was given to her. We don't need to, you know, be anti-Mary just because the Catholics have done what they've done with her. Um, just read it for what it is, uh, who Mary is. And, um, you know, she needed God, to, Jesus to save her. Jesus died for her the cross. She accepted it. There's no question about that. Um, and she lived a very godly life, as far as we can tell. Yeah, she's a, a good person. But we're not supposed to look at good people. We're supposed to look at Jesus. As good as we can be, remember, God is infinitely good. It doesn't matter. Mary and Hitler are an equal standing in terms of how far away they are from God. They're wholly other than God's holiness. Um, all of us are in the same boat. That's it for the Mary. And then, then there's Orthodoxy at the end. Okay. <laughs> it's an interesting thing, too. But, I mean, how many Americans, how often do we run into Orthodox Christians? I mean, it's, they're there, but they don't even tell you they're Orthodox. <laughs> oh, you yeah. We used to live next door. Yeah. And, uh, they go to Florida. Next door to me. He's Orthodox. But whenever we pray, I mean, um, you know, she His just brother didn't marry the first time very long. And uh, they met in Italy. My brother's in the military, and um, they met there and got married. And, um, I mean, it's so cultural. I feel like her thing every year, she kind of, she's so trying to hold on to who she is and, the, you know, her culture. That, like, when we pray, like, she has a Presbyterian church, but when she prays, she does the sign of the cross and everything. So I'm interested in this. It is interesting. The Orthodox churches tie themselves so closely to their ethnicity, don't they? There's the Greek Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church. It's, it, But they'll tell you, no, no, there's an Orthodox Church. You're the ones that keep naming yourself after your ethnicity. So there's something about it that you're trying to hold on to that you identify so closely. When we're in Russia, you ask people, you know, well, do you, what religion are you? I'm Russian. I know. But what religion are you? I am Russian. You know, isn't that enough? They just mean, I'm Russian Orthodox. What do you mean what religion am I? What country are you in, dude? Uh, that's how closely they tie it to their nationality and their ethnicity. It's, it's crazy. Uh, we actually agree with them about a lot of things, especially when it's about uh, what's wrong with the Catholic Church. They get a lot of things right in the Orthodox Church, but in other things, they get it worse than the Catholic Church in terms of being off base. It's uh, it's funny, like, man, how can you guys be like going the right way and then go off the other way? If you're interested, we'll talk about it another time, but um, it's a, it was more important to talk about. Any questions? You guys, you gonna come back? Okay, because remember, I'm done. So you know, <laughs> love it or hate it.